Good morning. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is John Herbst. I run the Dinu Patrutu Eurasia Center here at the Atlantic Council. We're putting on today's event, Central Asia, U.S. Foreign Policy at a Great Power Crossroads. We're doing it in conjunction with our partner, the Institute for the Analysis of Global Security, IAGS. They are the co-sponsor of today's event. Uh, we have a wonderful panel for you. I will not I will introduce them, but I'm not going to read their biographies. You have a sheet with their biographies on. Uh, we have Mr. Yurkin Akhinzanov of the, the DCM at the Embassy of Kazakhstan. We have Ms. Nisha Biswal, who was the former Assistant Secretary of State for South and Central Asia in the Obama administration. We have Dr. Ariel Cohn, who's well known as a commentator on all things Eurasia and energy. And we have Mr. Katalis Helmer, the co-founder and partner of Envoy LLP, and a former senior advisor to the President of Kazakhstan. With that, Prime Minister, thank you. With that, I'd like to invite our panel up, and we'll start our conversation. Jurgen, I think I'll start with you. We, we, we have really interesting, interesting things going on in Central Asia. You had the uh, turn of leadership in Uzbekistan with the passing of President Karimov, and a certain easing of policies, certainly with the neighbors, and also internally. You have uh, this extraordinary project, which some people call the Project of the Century, the One Belt, One Road initiative from China, to create a, a transportation corridor and an industrial belt across Eurasia. You have the ongoing large role of Russia in the region. You have continuing instability in Afghanistan and what that may mean for Central Asia, the spread of Islamic extremism. So many, many things are happening. And um, Jurgen. How do things look to you as a representative of Hazistan? How does Astana look at, for example, Chinese developments mm -hmm. and the change in Uzbekistan? Well, thank you, Ambassador. First of all, thank you for inviting me to speak uh, at this very, very important event today in this uh, very important place. And um, I believe uh, the focus on Central Asia is not just uh, just uh, an, uh, 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 merely kind of uh, an interest uh, of, of a season, but it, it reflects the, the developments which were going on for the last few years. Because what is happening right now, we cannot uh, divide from what was happening before. And here I have my colleagues, and of course, distinguished Nisha Biswal, who, uh, who was one of the masterminds behind the Central Asian focus of the United States foreign policy. And um, this is very important for us as well. Um, and what is interesting that unlike discussions, similar discussions in the last year, in previous years, this year we have, uh, we are witnessing uh, some specific tangible results and of course results and outcomes based on efforts made previously. Um, yes, developments are important. Those developments which are going on in neighboring countries and those policies which they now adopt towards their neighbors and we welcome very much those uh, new policies uh, which uh, now uh, we see in Tashkent, from Tashkent, we witness in Tashkent, because they help very much uh, us to, um, sure. to cover the gap in, 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 in cooperation which existed before. As everyone w uh, agreed that Central Asia was one of the least integrated regions in, in, in the world, uh, and what we needed, uh, really needed, is to develop to develop uh, 
connectivity among ourselves first, in the first instance. And that was uh, the uh, great, I, the greatest idea behind uh, joint initiative C5 plus 1, which was developed uh, during previous administration. Uh, it, it, just, it not just boosted cooperation between United States and the Central Asia, but it boosted cooperation among Central Asians themselves. That is the ultimate value of that initiative. And we are glad to see that this C5 plus one initiative is still on the table, and we are talking about continuing uh, interaction uh, uh, under this uh, format. Definitely, we welcome, uh, as I said, mentioned Uzbekistan's development and welcome their um, initiatives. Uh, we had two highest level visits just in, in a very short period of time from Tashkent to Astana. Uh, and we have uh, we, we witnessed uh, a very intensive uh, interaction between Tashkent and Bishkek, Tashkent and Ashgabat and, 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 and Dushanbe and everyone in Central Asia. And definitely we welcome that uh, uh, that other initiatives like New Silk Road, uh, that One Belt, One Road, Chinese One Belt, One Road, are kind of compatible to these efforts. And they add to the momentum we generate. And uh, it is different. Definitely, it's different uh, <coughs> by, uh, let us say, by planning, by some uh, approach, uh, some technical, financial aspects. But it's, there is no, nothing conflicting in that. And there is a lot of compatible elements, reinforcing elements. Because being, uh, um, I would say, being, being a, a, a transit territory in a Silk Route, it's good, it's profitable. But being a crossroad where you have crossroads of different initiatives from west to, to, to the east, uh, from, or from the east to the west, from north to the south, it's even better. And it's even better. And now it's bringing fruit because uh, we, you know uh, that we have already attracted billions and billions of investments into uh, infrastructure projects. Uh, both under Chinese One Belt, One Road initiative uh, from international financial institutions as well as from our own resources, national program uh, Nurul Jol, uh, combined and uh, compatible with each other, uh, producing a really, really great effect. Uh, as, you, as you already have heard for several, for many times, that um, uh, Transportation, uh, rail, uh, I would say, rail cargo, rail freight. Uh, already we have 70% of rail freight from China to Europe going through Kazakhstan. And one may argue about uh, um, and compare uh, viability of uh, land transportation routes versus mar marine transportation routes. Uh, track gawk, technical issues like track gawk, et, et cetera, et cetera. But I can say that it works. This is the difference of this year. It started working. It started bringing fruit. 70% of freight from China to Europe goes through, through Kazakhstan. Uh, time uh, for, for a train uh, to, to pass the border is just 30 minutes, and et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so many things are happening. Uh, logistic companies of, of countries, uh, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, uh, Georgia, uh, now forming, uh, 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 establishing a consortium which uh, facilitates uh, all those bureaucracy and te technicalities, m making uh, transportation easier, faster, and cheaper, uh, like one window, one tariff, etc. And definitely, this is uh, all positive developments. And uh, you mentioned Afghanistan. Absolutely. We welcome reinforced focus of this present administration on Afghanistan. 
which was as well the priority for the, for the previous administration. This uh, makes us uh, to reinforce our own efforts into northern distribution network, into related Silk Road initiatives which uh, envisage engagement of Afghanistan, uh, promoting connectivity of Afghanistan uh, with, with the rest of the world. <coughs> Uh, the same relates to Russian initiatives. Uh, we have a common joint project uh, uh, which we call Eurasian Economic Union. Absolutely, this is uh, geography speaks for itself. We cannot but live with our neighbors, live uh, in the way uh, uh, everyone pro uh, get, uh, let us say, everyone finds itself in a win-win situation. Since independence, for the last 25 years, Kazakhstan has never been uh, hostile to anyone. We've been following a, f uh, a, a, a f uh, um, diplomacy first relations, uh, type of relations with everyone, and we have made this um, not by but capitulation, but by honest and open interaction, offering a win-win scenarios to everyone. So this is, uh, I'm afraid not in a nutshell, but, but a kind of overview of what is going on and our approach and our assessment of this. A, a very positive assessment. A very positive. Otherwise, okay. you, can't, you, can't, you can't look forward, not being positive. <coughs> okay. <laughs> Nisha, uh, you, you, you actually ran our Central Asia policy for several years. Uh, you've had a chance to decompress, being out of the government now for a few months. How does Central Asia look to you? Uh, are you optimistic about the region's trajectory? Do you think the changes we're seeing in Uzbekistan augur well for the region? Do you think the Chinese role is going to be positive in, in Central Asia as this, as this initiative develops? Um, well, again, uh, let me echo Jurgen's comments in saying it's a pleasure to be here at the Atlantic Council and also just let me appreciate the role that the Atlantic Council has played on keeping a spotlight on this very important region. Um, we'll invite you back. <laughs> I, I, it, would, it would be an honor to, to continue that. Uh, um, but I think it, it is an important region, and sometimes the importance of this region um, is not uh, front burner for, uh, for policymakers and leaders you know, at, the, at the principal levels. Um, what I think in, in the previous administration, what we tried to do is um, first, because we had uh, bifurcated responsibilities for Afghanistan and Pakistan from the rest of the Bureau, I'll admit quite freely that that gave me the bandwidth and capacity to really look at the region in much more uh, granularity and look at the opportunities that that presented. Um, and so I think for, for, the, for all intents and purposes, the way that we had been able to really um, look at our relationships both individually and collectively in Central Asia and in South Asia uh, in some ways benefited from the fact that I didn't have the day-to-day -day responsibility to manage Afghanistan and Pakistan policy. Um, and what we grasped very quickly was indeed that um, Central Asia had an important role to play in and of itself. Um, in, in, in prior times, I think Central Asia was looked at through the lens of how, do, how does Central Asia fit in with our uh, policy in Afghanistan and with our, uh, with our needs and priorities in Afghanistan. And that is certainly a very important lens. But I think what we were able to bring into it is that in and apart from its relevance to Afghanistan's stability and security, that Central Asia stability, security, and prosperity in Central Asia was in and of itself a priority for the Obama administration. And not just for the United States and the Obama administration. I think what you saw in the last three years was a great deal of attention being focused on Central Asia by a lot of different <coughs> actors. Um, certainly there is the, the Russia, China, increasingly also Iran kind of co dynamic and competition in the region, but you saw um, 
the year that we launched the C5 um, initiative and Secretary Kerry made his trip to Central Asia to all five uh, countries and, and we had the C5 in Samarkand, you also saw uh, the UN Secretary General visit all five Central Asian countries. You saw President uh, you saw Prime Minister Narendra Modi visit all five countries. You saw uh, Abe visit all five countries. Um, and you saw the, the EU also take a very significant interest in the region and, and try to uh, step up its own engagement. Um, the Koreans have their own sub-ministerial level C5 engagement that they uh, have had for a number of years. And I think all of that points towards the desire and the need for Central Asia to be able to have a connectivity agenda, not just economic uh, and infrastructure connectivity, but also uh, political and security connectivity. And the need for um, countries to be able to engage, not just individually, but also uh, holistically in the region. Uh, so the C5 plus one was born out of a very apparent and evident need for that platform. And and I think um, increasingly uh, there is also a desire for the efficiency that that provides in terms of addressing some of the common areas of, of both uh, um, interests and, and challenges um, for the region. So, so for the Obama administration, it was a very practical solution. Um, it also allowed for, I think, for Secretary Kerry to therefore be able to engage and to engage with his counterparts on issues that were not only important to the region, but where the region could play a role on issues that were important globally. And so we had not just one interaction of the C5 plus one, but by my count, I think we had four uh, during Secretary Kerry's tenure, including one at, uh, in New York up at the UNGA um, in Samarkand, uh, in Washington when we hosted, um, and then in Hamburg right before the end of the administration at the OSCE. Uh, we also were able to establish working groups to start taking the political uh, dialogue that was started and drilling it down into concrete issues and initiatives that could be supported uh, through this collective format. And so we um, developed uh, working groups on um, uh, economic connectivity, on security, and on environment. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't focus directly on energy because energy is still a fairly sensitive issue uh, between the countries and we thought looking at this a little bit more um, obliquely through the economic lens and through the environmental lens would create some space for us to be able to talk about um, some of the uh, energy issues that are at the heart. And then I will just um, um, note that the political transition in Uzbekistan, which I think before it happened was something that had been dreaded and feared quite a bit in terms of what that would mean uh, for uh, political stability. Um, that political transition was uh, affected um, with uh, uh, amazing degree of stability and continuity. And um, I think President Mirziyoyev has come on the scene with a mind towards bringing Uzbekistan uh, into the, um, um, the, the modern stage of political engagement, to, to come out of its, its history, its past, and, and look to its future by uh, modernizing and updating its engagements with, within the region and with the world. And I think that that has brought about some interesting opportunities for the C5 format, but also um, for the region as a whole. And we're starting to see some of that in terms of the very uh, robust uh, interaction that you're starting to see uh, within the region um, on bilateral and minilateral um, initiatives that that are unfolding. And we're also seeing some, um, some movement in, in with respect to issues of, um, of, of human rights and labor and, and um, social concerns that have been uh, at uh, uh, very prominent uh, in our engagement and in our interactions uh, with the region. Oh, thank you very much. And again, uh, you deserve a lot of credit for that C5 plus one initiative from your time and state. And we're all grateful to you for that. But you like, you're going to have been very upbeat. So it's time to get a little bit darker. 
So Ariel. Well, we we uh, wanted to make sure we, we left some space uh, there. Uh, Ariel, I, I know that you, that you have a, um, some forebodings about developments in the region, at least as far as American interests are concerned. So please share them with us. Uh, thank you very much, John, and uh, thank you for Atlantic Council uh, for cooperation with IAGS, Institute for the, the Analysis of Global Security. Um, uh, the Institute does a lot of one belt, one road work, and I'm both part of the Atlantic Council and of the Institute. Um, Nisha, I very much respect and congratulate you on C plus, C5 plus one. But unfortunately, President Obama is, correct me if I'm wrong, never visited the region. And he was begged, but, well, he was re requested uh, <laughs> by uh, the countries he flew over uh, to the Asian summits of different kinds to stop by and have meetings, and that never happened. And also, from extensive travel in the region, uh, my take home is that uh, our profile uh, over the last eight years in the region declined. It's continuing to decline. Uh, this is based on um, discussions with both senior uh, officials there and our senior representatives there. Uh, in addition, uh, oftentimes we did watch, and the Pentagon did definitely, uh, watch the region through the lens of our engagement in Afghanistan. And John asked me to talk about geopolitics, and I think both Afghanistan as a geographic area and the spread of uh, violent extremism or radical Islam, depends on which administration terminology you want to use, uh, that it, these are uh, destabilizing factors. And I like to look at geopolitics both as functions of geography but also functions of history. There's a spatial dimension and there's a temporal from time dimension. And the challenge and the pressure the radical Islamists are bringing to that region as well as to the Middle East and worldwide is the past trying to seize the present. It is a past uh, looking or, or past oriented uh, ideological, uh, religious uh, movement. And uh, when you start looking uh, at who is going where, 1,300 Tajiks going to fight in the Middle East, uh, maybe 400 Kyrgyz, uh, maybe about the same number of Kazakhs, you ask yourself a question. What are these men and also women uh, are looking uh, for by joining the Islamic State, for example, Daesh? And the answer is that in those areas that are desperate, in those areas that are impoverished, in those areas that don't offer uh, what the Russians call social lifts, uh, social mobility, upward mobility, these men and women are looking for uh, the solutions, the fake solutions radical Islam uh, is offering to them. And if you look at the attacks at the uh, Istanbul Airport and the attack uh, at the disco uh, or nightclub in Istanbul, these were all uh, Chechens, Uzbeks, and others. At the same time, as uh, Nisha and uh, John and the uh, Deputy Chief of Mission already mentioned, there's a lot of um, optimism because of the uh, tentative openings of Uzbekistan. Uh, I would add that uh, these are um, openings not just of Uzbekistan in and of itself. This may, for the first time since the independence, open the path to a real regional dynamic mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, for example, Uzbekistan that is a consumer of water uh, cooperating with the uh, producers of electricity, the mountainous states of Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. Uh, this may open the new ways to cooperate for Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. And the more they cooperate, the more difficult it will be for a regional hegemon, be it from the east or from the north, to establish their imprimatur on that region. And I think if you're looking at what 
your wish list is, what my wish list is for the Trump administration is A, of course, engagement, build on the good things the Obama administration did, such as uh, C5 plus one, but also uh, make your strategic goal that no one hegemonic power comes to dominate the five Central Asian states. Uh, if you go to today's um, Forbes and find the article about the Silk Road and Kazakhstan there, you'll find what great economic uh, progress the country has done in the last 25 years. <coughs> the Astana International Financial Center uh, that, will, that is led by a well-known personality here in Washington, Kairat Kilimbetov, uh, is a potential for a securities trading platform for a court based by English law. That things like that don't exist uh, between Europe and Beijing. The only other place I could think of is Dubai. Uh, so the securities trading platform, the, uh, uh, the court, the arbitration tribunal, and when Kazakhstan brings its companies, the big companies, for the IPO, they will be traded at the Astana International uh, Financial Center. Uh, you see a, an ambitious agenda to move Kazakhstan from the frontier market designation to an emerging market designation. Can they do it? Of course they can. They'll bring the Bolshak graduates back, uh, these people getting you know, engaged in important work uh, in the economy. And I think this is, to a great extent, a model for all five uh, Central Asian countries. But beyond that, a secular state with a majority Muslim population is not something you find a lot uh, in this uh, world. Uh, do people have uh, freedom of religion? To certain degrees in different countries based on what the security threats uh, are dictating. And in countries that are more uh, heavily uh, religious driven, you find actually even less uh, uh, less <coughs> religious freedom for uh, Christians, Buddhists, Jews, um, and others, or minority Muslim uh, sects uh, in different countries, whether it's Shia, Ahmadiyya, etc. So getting the religious peace right, getting the market reforms peace right, getting the balance between Russia, which is an historical imperial power, China, which is sitting in the you know, back of the historic memory, even before Russia. Uh, the Iranian uh, Shia radicalism, the Sunni radicalism. Turkey is still involved. We'll see how Turkey will continue uh, being involved, how the evolving uh, Turkish Islamic model uh, will resonate or not in Central Asia. All these are important people. And we here in the United States, uh, stuck in this terrible conflict in this town, um, need to remember there is a vast world outside. And our vital national interests, security, fighting terrorism, economic development. Uh, my friend Catullus Helmer is going to talk about alternative energy, a very important part of the 21st century agenda. All the things are out there. And without us educating ourselves about geography, about history, about politics, about religion, we will not be able to competitively play in this world. Thank you very much. Ariel, thank you. That was a, a masterful, wide presentation. Um, and you've just foreshadowed our next conversation. Katolis, um, if you could talk about, because people here are not really well under, not well in, understand well, development of green energy, especially in Central Asia and Kazakhstan. If you can enlighten us. Okay, thank you, Ambassador, and thank you also to the Atlantic Council for the invitation to be part of this wonderful conversation with our esteemed colleagues. Um, let me first, before answering the nub of your question, let me build on something that uh, Dr. Cohen just mentioned, which is, Putting this into context, if we're talking about economic security, which I think alternative energy is clearly a part of, um, 
Dr. Khan mentioned progress and ambition in Kazakhstan. I, I think it's important to, to, to put Kazakhstan's economic achievements into perspective. Um, Kazakhstan is one of the few countries that has achieved a successful transformation. We need to think back to uh, independence and, and we look at concrete results as the, the, the DCM mentioned also earlier. Two decades of 7% growth. An economy largely built on the back of foreign direct investment. Starting with oil and gas and uh, extractive industries but progressively moving out into services, uh, technology, transportation, financial services. A halving of unemployment to a level that I, I think any developed economy would be, would be jealous of today. These are remarkable uh, achievements. Uh, but my message is that Kazakhstan needs to go through a second transformation. Uh, it's, it's, at a, it's at a cusp. Um, I, I think that very clearly these last two years have demonstrated the limitations of a natural resource intensive economy. If you look at the, the currency, if you look at uh, GDP growth, the correlation is not exactly one, but it's close. So the falls in, in commodity prices have, uh, uh, have led to a, a fall in, in, in growth uh, and competitiveness in, in tandem. Uh, so Kazakhstan is, is faced at, at a point where new investments need to be made, new sources of growth uh, need, to be, need, need to be procured. Uh, and energy intensity and modernization of the economy uh, needs, to be, needs to be brought to, to, to the fore. Uh, and alternative energy is, is an important part of this, of this process. Um, that's, why, that's why you see Expo dedicated to future energy. That's why you see that the president uh, at the Astana Economic Forum last month say very clearly that Kazakhstan needs to pursue a gradual transition towards an economy based on clean energy. This is not uh, an, an argument to reduce uh, production or to uh, interfere with the existing economic base. This is an argument to expand the economic base. And I would look at it as a very significant opportunity. It's a $120 billion opportunity, as estimated by the government. Uh, half of that is for new sources of energy, not just renewables, but, but gas, gasification of the country uh, in areas where electricity, there is a deficit, uh, gas provides a potential, potential solution. It's also about upgrading inefficient infrastructure, modernization of water treatment systems, upgrading of district heating systems, new energy efficient construction. This is a significant opportunity. If we look at renewable energy alone, $350 billion globally of, of investment went into this industry last year. This is a very, very significant flow of, in, of investment. Kazakhstan has an opportunity to harness some of those flows. And that's, I, I think, the basis for uh, the concept on green economy transition, which the government has, has developed. Um, and it's this. Uh, the, the jeopardy of relying upon a naturally resource intensive economy looking to the future that's driving this new momentum. And I think this is, this is, very, this is a very wise uh, approach. Um, I, I'm working with the EBRD at the moment, uh, helping the, the government and uh, the new Astana International Financial Center think through these issues, uh, what is the role of uh, the AIFC in, in harnessing green finance, harnessing in investment flows um, to provide for uh, the, the, the capital to make these, the, these investments work. Uh, and through that process, you, you're going to see some structural shifts in the economy. We've already discovered uh, within the banking sector there are some significant limitations. There is a significant access to capital problem for these projects. Banks can't lend f beyond seven years. There's a long-term access to capital problem. Uh, and so addressing these issues also addresses underlying structural issues as well. So um, 
I, I think the, the opportunity is clear, uh, that the motivations are clear, uh, and Kazakhstan's ambition and the results that it's delivered give confidence that the second transformation can, can be achieved. Um, I, I think that the, the timing is also about right. Uh, if, we, if we think about um, Angus Madison, the, the, the you know, economic historian, he, he revealed to us that three out of the four economies that get as far as Kazakhstan has, they end up growing much, much more slowly. Growth falls. They get stuck in something other economists have called a middle income trap. So getting out of that middle income trap or not falling into it in the first place, that takes change. That takes a commitment to transformation uh, and a commitment to pursuing new sources of, of economic growth. And, and so I would say, just to, just to conclude, it, it makes me think of something that, uh, that, that Winston Churchill said. He, he said that history is going to be kind to me because I will write it. <laughs> and I think you can apply that here. Uh, history will be kind to Kazakhstan if it continues to write it. The inverse is true. Also, history will be unkind to Kazakhstan if it doesn't write it and adheres to the status quo. So I'll, I'll uh, end there. You, you, again, you provided a very um, upbeat picture of green energy in Kazakhstan. But what is your assessment? Where will Kazakhstan be 20 years in terms of production <coughs> of green energy? What yeah. percentage of their energy output will be coming from renewables? So, so the government, I come back to my, my comment about uh, ambition. Uh -huh. Uh, under this concept to uh, transition to a green economy, the, the targets are very clear. Uh, and Kazakhstan has, uh, has sub submitted a, a nationally determined uh, contribution to the Paris Agreement. That calls for a 15%, 15 reduction in emissions. To what year? Uh, to 20, 2020. The concept on green economy uh, transition calls for 30% of alternative energy generated by 2030. 30, 30. Currently, that, that percentage is, is um, it, close to zero. It's 1.5%. So it's a very ambitious target. It's set into law, but a significant amount of work needs to take place. Uh, I, I don't think standing at uh, sitting uh, on this podium, uh, it's insurmountable. Uh, the, the capital is available. Uh, the, the, the capital the, domestically is available? The, the capital domestically is, the is, is available. Despite the price of oil. The capital domestically is, is, is available, but the capital domestically doesn't need to be available because internationally it is available. Large renewable energy companies around the world are seeking stable, business-friendly markets like Kazakhstan to invest in. You look around the world, uh, and large renewable energy companies are investing around the world. They're not just investing in Western Europe and the United States any longer, although they are investing very aggressively in those markets. They're investing in Latin America, South America, Africa. Why shouldn't Kazakhstan be a part of, part of that process? And I think that the government is, is very aggressively trying to take part in that process. So renewable energy legislation has been passed amendments to that legislation were, were passed in april of this year which tweaked uh, some of the, the the barriers to international investment ebrd has supported uh, three renewable energy projects which are under construction at the moment so there is there is there is work being done uh, i would i would say that uh, that work needs to take place faster in order to achieve those those very ambitious targets. Renewable energy projects take many years to, to build and, and to commission. Okay, thank you. Um, Nishi, you want to jump in I here? Just, well, just to say, at the risk of all of us sounding a little bit too much like a promotional panel for Central Asia, and there are lots of good <laughs> reasons to be promotional about Central Asia. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a region that deserves to be promoted. Um, but there are obviously uh, significant risks ahead as well. Please. And, and I think it's important that we acknowledge those risks as well, right? I mean, I think, 
you know, on the on the on the political side, I would say that while we are seeing a degree of political modernization in Kazakhstan, in Kyrgyzstan, and in um, Uzbekistan, that there's a great deal um, of concern about the lack of political modernization or political progress or reform in Tajikistan or Turkmenistan. And that is something that I think you know, we've got to acknowledge and, and say that this, this is of concern. And not anything that we haven't raised directly with them publicly and privately, um, but is something to, to worry about. I think as we talk about how the economic realities are increasingly defining the geopolitical vision of these countries rather than you know, the past um, several decades where it was the, the reverse that the geopolitics was defining their economics, I would say that, that an economic vision is now starting to kind of inform and, and propel their uh, their foreign policy vision, and that's a and that's a good thing. I think that that is something that we're starting to see everywhere. But then, opening up and liberalizing the economy, combating corruption, addressing transparency, addressing things like, you know, uh, the ability for capital to flow in and out more freely, uh, currency convertibility. All of these continue to be big challenges across the region that inhibit uh, greater trade and investment. So if you want to be able to move beyond. The, the kind of uh, investment that is <clears throat> government driven um, and to be able to attract um, you know, private capital and private technology that comes with private capital, um, then I think that increasing the pace of economic reforms and um, um, liberalization is going to be critical. And I think Kazakhstan has been taking significant steps and I think you know, one of the big focus um, of our economic agenda was Kazakhstan's uh, accession to the WTO, which we worked very closely mm -hmm. with them on. <coughs> and that was a very significant step. But I think these are still challenges. And can the pace of reform and the creation of opportunity uh, meet the pace of demand from within their own populations? Or do you risk you know, these populations feeling uh, increasingly disenchanted and disenfranchised by a lack of opportunity and, and pursue um, some of the darker <coughs> scenarios, um, you know, that, uh, um, you know, Ariel um, re referred to or alluded to in his presentation. I think those are, those are points Thank you. to consider. Okay. I just uh, yeah uh, I just would like to add a few words. Uh, oh, by the way, you saw, you you talked about the next stage of modernization. We call it third modernization of the country. Uh, first was when we I mean first stage was when uh, when we were trying to get out of collapse of the Soviet Union. <laughs> Second was when we yes definitely availed of those oil and gas projects, and now we uh, approached the third. And here I come to the, uh, with this third, the, 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 very, uh, the very idea uh, of the third modernization is to tackle those challenges which you have just mentioned. Um, yeah, we, had, we have a success story of cooperation with the United States, with other countries in developing uh, really great projects in, 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 in boosting development in different areas. Uh, cooperating, um, nuclear non-proliferation, uh, uh, energy security, other issues uh, like uh, religious dialogue, comprehensive religious dialogue. But definitely the challenges and threats of present uh, make us to, 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 to look beyond, uh, let us say, short-term perspective. And uh, the present cr economic crisis, the present threats, geopolitical threats, which are emanating from different places, uh, ma made us to think and to look differently at what we've been doing before in tackling similar cha challenges before uh, in the past. And that, that what we call third modernization, which is not only about economics, this is about politics, social sphere, other, other, uh, other, uh, other areas. And uh, d uh, definitely, 
what we see here that we invite all our old and time proven friends and partners in the first instance the United States to take part in that in, in, in that efforts in those efforts especially taking into account that those efforts are, can bring I mean, I mean all those who participate in this can benefit considerably whether be it economically or politically. This is uh, the, 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 the idea about third monetization. Thank you. Okay, Ariel. If you look um, at the quality of reform process and quality of leadership, as I do for the sins of my age uh, for 25 years, and you remember how it started in Russia, how it started in the Baltic states, I would say throughout the former Soviet Union, with the exception of the Baltic states, which is sui generis, it's a whole different story, because again of history of culture, of uh, economic ties that that region had with the Scandinavian countries, with Germany and with, with the rest of Europe. Uh, I would say Kazakhstan demonstrated for 25 years uh, the best uh, quality of leadership and of economic reform conceptualization and implementation. Think about it. The development of Kazakhstan in the Soviet era, and I have family ties into Kazakhstan of, on both sides of my family, my mother's side and my father's side. Um, this was a place where one third of the population was forcibly starved by the communists and then Stalin would be exiling whole ethnic groups, whole peoples, Volga Germans, Koreans and others, Chechens and others. So it was a, excuse my French, a dumping ground for undesirable ethnic groups by Stalin and then it became a nuclear testing ground with 300 uh, explosions, nuclear explosions. And that country came from the back, from behind, to have a GDP, according to Forbes today, twice as big as Ukraine. Yes, it's oil and gas, but you need to develop oil and gas. It doesn't grow on trees. So, so far, we saw a quality of leadership and reform. The big question for the next 25 years is the leadership of Kazakhstan will be able to manage the future as well as they managed the last 25 years, not to slide into political instability and continue the third modernization and then the fourth modernization in such a way that really between Europe and the Pacific, this is this, the country that provide the critical mass for modernization and growth. If, if I can just pick up on something that Nisha said uh, about providing for the, the domestic population. Uh, certainly in, in, in Kazakhstan, uh, there is a disconnect between GDP per capita and average wages. The returns to investment have gone to capital, that they haven't gone to labor. So what, what is the answer uh, to, to that? That's partly unleashing entrepreneurship, supporting small and medium-sized enterprises on the one hand, which is largely a function of the health of the banking sector. Uh, and there are some issues there that need to be resolved. Uh, it's also a function of the state getting out of the economy and uh, the, the privatization program that's mm -hmm. underway, very ambitious privatization program, will allow an opening up, in theory, of, of the economy to entrepreneurial driven forces. That's a, that's a long term process, that's not a, uh, that, that's not a short term process, but you can see the direction of travel. I'd like to jump in here with, with one comment and then a final question before we turn to the audience. I think that, um, Ariel, your description of the leadership in Kazakhstan is accurate, but incomplete. I think the final measure of the current leadership will be the succession and the future leadership. 
And if we can say, whenever it happens, that things were as smooth in Astana as they were in Tashkent, that will be a very positive thing to say, if we can. Now, one last, one last question that I think we have to, have to ask, because this conversation so far has been a little bit like talking about Shakespeare without mentioning Hamlet, which is, and I'll, I'll pose it to Ariel, uh, given the current pricing of hydrocarbons, one, what is the impact of that pricing in Central Asia? And two, uh, what does that mean for the future of the region? Um, at the danger of being the hated man in Astana <laughs> and Baku, I would say and, and, this is not a bad thing necessarily if, first of all, they already priced it into the value of the currency. The devaluations, as painful as they were, happened. Two, at least in Kazakhstan, they woke up. I mean, they knew it all along, but they woke up even harder to the necessity of diversifying away from the hydrocarbons. And I would add raw materials in general. If we had time to discuss why Kazakhstan needs or doesn't need nuclear power energy generation, because it's zero emission, but it comes with a slew of other problems. That could be an interesting discussion. Kazakhstan has, some say the first, some say the second largest deposits of uranium in the world. But beyond that, it is things like the alternative energy development center that will be sited in the Expo campus that I've seen, it's fantastic architect, architecture. The American Pavilion, very ably managed by its executive director who is here with us. And uh, the AIFC uh, that will be uh, sited there, moved to the uh, Expo campus. Uh, these are the services that will drive the economy. I would add to that, as everywhere in the world, the biomed, biomedical field, improving the quality of healthcare, maybe moving into uh, biotech development. These are the examples of where the added value will come uh, in the future. And yes, Kazakhstan was blessed. It was lucky to have 25 or 20 years of high oil and gas prices. The people of Kazakhstan, I've been to Kazakhstan many times. I don't count. The people of Kazakhstan are smart and disciplined enough. This discipline is very important to make this jump, to make this transition to the non-hydrocarbon and non-raw materials economy. OK, with that, let's open it up to the audience. OK, right here. What's your next? Please identify yourself before you ask the question. Yeah, hi, my name is Arman Kalyani. I'm a student, and I'm in town on an internship. And I just had a question about uh, if you've been to some of the uh, speaking events around town over the last week, it seems like people are pretty convinced that ISIS is on its way out as a physical caliphate. And when that happens, uh, there's not going to be much reason for many of these Central Asian uh, members of ISIS to stick around. So I assume that they're going to return. Is this, do you think, going to have a significant impact on stability in Central Asia? And what is the plan for when this does happen? Thank you. OK. And then you should. So, uh, uh, go ahead. No, no, please. I mean, I, I do think that this is something that um, all five governments are very attuned to and aware of. Um, and I imagine that um, they will have a great deal of insight onto the individuals who are seeking to return and will have an ability to have some control on that. Yeah, from the perspective of the Kazakhstan government, I would say that, yes, this is uh, the problem we have to, uh, to deal with. And we have uh, our own national programs, our own national legislation to deal with uh, both uh, those who are criminals, actual who are committed crimes on the radical uh, 
being radical uh, Islamists, and those who are di who didn't do that, but uh, uh, radicalized in one or another way, but need to uh, need to uh, let us say to be uh, patiently, <coughs> I would say, treated to to be deradicalized. De this is, uh, we also <coughs> doing these problems uh, uh, jointly with the United States, with the awesome. USAID. Uh, and this is not uh, only about Kazakhs, uh, Kazakh nationals, uh, to de-radicalize de them. This is also about uh, nationals of other Central Asian countries who choose uh, Kazakhstan as their destination. You, you know, Kazakhstan, due to the fact of uh, better economic conditions, is a destination for labor and other migrants. From, uh, from, from neighboring countries. And this is also uh, 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 the challenge we are facing and we are trying to solve. And let me just add one thing, sorry. Um, so Kazakhstan has taken a very nuanced approach and I think it's really important to note um, the various distinctions they make in terms of how they try to engage with populations, how they try to deal with things like uh, um, um, dissemination of, of um, ideology that creates radicalization and how they try to uh, do that. I think the big challenge for many countries is going to be to not over calibrate and over um, step on this, which creates its own backlash. And I think that's the challenge that we've seen in a number of countries in the region. And we've quite openly urged that they coordinate and collaborate with Kazakhstan and draw from some of their approaches in how they're looking at this so that you don't create uh, a massive backlash and a, and a further um, um, radicalization by a, um, um, a crackdown that is too extreme in its own right. And that's the challenge. Well, and to con compare and contrast, as they say, if you see what the French and the British services are doing, they're letting very bad actors out in the streets. They know that these people fought in Afghanistan or in the Middle East. They try to track them somehow. They often fail. And then these people go out and murder people in the streets of London, Paris, Toulouse, Brussels, Nice, and the list is long. So we have these days, right, nuanced approaches, nuanced approaches. You can see also how people behave. I'll give you one example. Uh, there is a new draft uh, of law, a new bill in Uzbekistan to crack down on polygamy. The mullahs who marry people in a secular country who are already married will be put on notice. And then there are people who come out and say, oh, no, 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 no. This is our tradition. This is, you know, a Sharia practice, whatever. So you get people out of the woodwork who can be identified as radicals, and then you make your own policy how to deal with that. And of course, by using biometrics, uh, using information technology to manage movement, you know, treat, treatment of people's movements in and out of the Middle East, in and out of the war zones, in and out of radical madrasas where they go. There are many tools for services without being excessively brutal to provide security for the population and provide stability uh, for these countries. And this is a challenge, and I think the United States should be involved in that, should be engaged in that, just to learn who is doing what to whom, uh, how people move. I mentioned the horrible terrorist attacks in Turkey, that people from Central Asia were involved. There's also hundreds, over a thousand uh, citizens of the Russian Federation from North Caucasus who went and fought, who will come back either to Russia itself or to the three countries of the Caucasus, five countries of Central Asia, or to Boston, as we, thought, we saw with the Tsarnaev brothers. So we have to be vigilant with that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next question, right here. <coughs> no, over here, in front. 
and then we'll get to that gentleman next. Mohammed Tahir from Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. On the other side of the picture, though, uh, I think Nisha, you hinted at the end of your uh, discussion that you know panel kind of uh, looks like a promotional for uh, for Central <coughs> Asia. <coughs> that the challenge that you mentioned, uh, the appalling challenges, some of them are really concerning for various uh, you know uh, organizations like uh, corruption, very much true to all of Central Asian countries. And then human rights, press freedom, like as I speak, uh, one of our reporters in Turkmenistan remains in jail from last two years. And number of uh, you know, backward steps we have seen in Tajikistan, for instance, also in Kazakhstan and, uh, and also Kyrgyzstan. Um, so uh, talking about the US Central, uh, US's Central Asia approach. Now, we, I believe we are at the stage of kind of reviewing all of them. So what should US be doing differently compared to the previous administrations to handle some of those issues? Thank you. I mean, I, I think that you have to incorporate uh, um, those issues which we, you know, um, loosely kind of grouped together as the human dimension, but it was essentially these issues of human rights, of press freedom, of religious freedom, of, of um, labor rights, etc., into the conversation. And it's a part of the political and social modernization of the region, right? How do you bring from a more uh, repressive totalitarian past into a future that is going to reflect, you know, that it's very hard to sustain that kind of a, uh, a, a governance model in the current modern and, and future society and still be economically connected and viable, right? And I think they are, I think by and large, the countries of the region understand that. I mean, I, I actually had a, a conversation with President Karimov specifically on this, on, on the fact that the the model of governance that has been the, the fact of Central Asia through its um, um, recent past is not the model of governance that is going to take Central Asia into the future. So then what is that transition and how uh, most effectively can the U.S. be a positive influence on, on that? Um, we try to do that uh, by, like I said, um, one, being prepared to engage, because I don't think you can influence at a remove. I think you have to be willing to engage, be part of the conversation, have a stake in the outcome. And, and so we did, uh, we did I think, um, try to double down on the diplomacy, on the engagement, be, uh, be present in these relationships, um, and to not shy away from the difficult conversations, and to create a space where we could have those conversations. I think we were able to um, have more impact than if we had essentially kind of held back and said, we won't engage on this and until you do X, Y, and Z. That's an active debate and an area of discussion. And different reasonable people can be on different sides of that, of that discussion. And we've had that discussion, you know, whether you talk about Cuba or you talk about Burma or you talk about, you know, any number of countries where we have had kind of a, a past record of how is the best way to try to influence change in, in this system, in this society. Um, I'm of the, of the mindset that you do it through engagement, um, that you do a, a, a cocktail of, um, or blend of partnership and pressure, and a certain amount of, though I get criticized for saying it, but a certain amount of of, of patience in terms of the time it takes to transition a society uh, from one to another um, <coughs> system of governance. Ariel. Uh, I'm most sympathetic to every human rights agenda, ev every rule of law agenda. I worked in rule of law projects for the World Bank and for others. We are not operating in the vacuum. There is an authoritarian model that is actively and aggressively pushed by Russia. There is the Chinese model that it has the backup of hundreds of billions of dollars behind it of the Chinese economy and investment. They could care less about the, the things that you and I uh, and Nisha and Ambassador will all cherish. 
we are operating in the real world. It is called realpolitik for a reason. It has to be imputed into our calculus of geopolitics, of security, of trade, of economics, of energy, and yes, the human dimension. And diplomacy is not a science, it's an art. And when you practice the art of diplomacy, that's how you create this calculus. Okay, next question in the back and then we'll get over here. Sure, Joshua Walker from the USA <laughs> Pavilion. Thank you for the shout out, Ariel. Uh, the question I have is given the title of this and I wanna follow up my colleague's comment, uh, Central Asia is really far for most Americans. And as much as we talk about how great it is, you need to go visit despite all the shortcomings, most Americans are focused on the immediate here and now. There are a lot less Central Asians in America than there are <coughs> Europeans or Asia. Um, given what you guys have described as kind of this opportunity for America and how a small investment could have a big impact, how do you convince the next generation uh, to focus on this area of the world? Is it by the realpolitik argument that China's doing it, Russia's there, the U.S. has to get involved? Is it based on the energy and kind of the technological areas of saying, look, we could do a lot more here? What's the argument that resonates to the so what question that we often get from students or others who say, why are we even talking about Central Asia? Why does it matter? Do we have to go back to history to talk about the Silk Road? What's your single largest argument when you're talking to the next generation to care about this region of the world? Um, you know, the, the frame that I use is that for America and for Americans, um, our security and our prosperity in the decades to come is increasingly going to be impacted <coughs> by the security and the prosperity of Asia. And how Asia grows, uh, whether or not Asia is ma able to maintain a uh, political um, stability um, and whether or not America and Americans and American companies and American universities are going to be relevant to Asia's growth. Are we going to be the engine that helps to power their growth? Are we going to be the technology on whose backs Asian societies, Asian cities are going to be built. That is going to determine whether our own prosperity um, continues to, to grow and whether we continue to enjoy the, st the, the security um, that we seek. And if you think about Asia, Asia is not China, Korea, Japan. Asia is a vast geography. China understands that. China doesn't look at Asia through the lens of East Asia. China looks at Asia through the lens of all of the geography uh, that, you know, that uh, the expanse that it occupies and plays across every field. And we have got to get out of our mental and cultural silos, uh, the, the silos that, that tend to kind of uh, define the bureaucratic warfare within the State Department and, you know, uh, and start playing this game in a far more uh, strategic and holistic way. And that requires us also as a society to stop defining ourselves as an island, but to understand our connection to all of these far-flung places, right? Uh, before, Ariel, before I give you a chance, I want to say something. I think, I think Nisha gave the answer, but let me, let me sharpen the focus a little bit. Central Asia is surrounded by all the great powers in the world with the exception of the United States. <laughs> it, is currently, it is currently a relatively stable region. But in fact, uh, things could quickly get out of hand. And an investment of American time and effort, not a very large investment, will help keep the place stable. And every country in the region, with the possible exception of Turkmenistan, wants us there. So, that, so that's our investment in Central Asia to prevent something nasty from happening. But let's flip the coin. Um, you have this truly extraordinary initiative that the Chinese are pushing, the One Belt, One Road. I'm not going to tell you it's going to succeed, but it may succeed. If it does, if you have rail traffic from Western China to Frankfurt or to Hamburg in 12 days, that's going to 
revolutionize global transportation, global commerce. And we want to be part of that too. So just because at this point in history, Central Asia is not a dynamic region, does not mean it cannot return to being a dynamic region as it was during the heyday of the Silk Road. Now with that, Ariel. Josh, if you're talking about sort of a person in the street, uh, an average person outside of the Beltway, not an Atlantic Council uh, intern, not a SAI student, you cannot address that without what I mentioned before, which is a vast improvement in our education system that we educate our school children uh, with a much higher level of instruction in history, geography, world politics, and foreign policy of some kind, foreign, foreign policy for high school. You teach more than I do. You probably have your impressions. I taught also. I taught in Loyola Marymount in the West Coast. I taught in Georgetown. It is a bear. It's a challenge when you do not have the basic groundwork done in high school or in middle school. So how do we address that? It's not just more money, it's, it's a priority. We did it with, was it title, Ambassador, was it title six in the Cold War for uh, title, eight. title? Title eight. Title eight mm -hmm. uh, with critical um, area studies. Area studies are out of the window in colleges right now. Um, we will not be, 20 years from now, we'll not be able to find people who speak the languages, who have the background for foreign service, for the intelligence community, for area officers in the military. Area officers as an institution, I think, is being phased out. So there is a strategic challenge that is necessary for <coughs> our national security and it's up to our leadership, it's up to us, to focus on that. So if, if I can take a stab at your question, Josh, um, I, I think the first thing to say is that the world is compressed, obviously. Although Central Asia is a long way in distance, it's not as far as it once, as it once was. And Kazakhstan in particular is uh, exceeding to the global stage and has made significant efforts to broadcast to, to the world. So uh, the, the messages, although they are still far away, that they are reaching into further corners than they once did. But it, I would think back to the, the reasons that attracted me to Kazakhstan and, and, and the region in, in, in the first place. I think if you divide up the world in, into markets, you see a division between countries and, and markets which are shrinking and aging and markets which are young and growing. Central Asia is in the latter category. And um, that's undeniable. And I, I think if you, if you assume that at least part of the upbeat assessments we've been talking about are achieved today, the trajectory of growth, the trajectory of assessment, it's, it's compelling. And so that, that certainly is what attracted me to the region in the first place, and in particular the disconnect, what, what you're talking about, between the awareness and the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Next question. Um, way over here, and I'll catch one in the back after that. Thank you very much. Uh, Shailan from Turkish Embassy. I have a short comment and one question. Uh, short comment as it's a, apparently a party promotional activity panel today. Let me promote Turkish engagement with the Central Asia. Uh, Turkey has <coughs> been, is, and possibly will be deeply involved in Central Asia. It's not only because of the deep historical background or kinship, but also pressing needs of today. Uh, that's why we have uh, bilateral, strong bilateral relations with each of the countries, and we are trying to benefit from the opening of uh, Uzbekistan. Uh, we have also trilateral mechanisms with Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkmenistan, and the next Turkey, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan summit will be tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. Um, also, this is why Turkey is one of the staunchest supporter and contributor of uh, Chinese initiative. Uh, 
and about the model uh, that you mentioned, uh, Ariel, a Turkish model. Uh, I think Turkey is one of the few countries that uh, uh, has a predominantly Muslim society and a democracy. Uh, whether this is a model to be replaced uh, or to be followed, I, we don't know. But what we know that uh, Turkey uh, has been engaging with all the uh, countries in the region, not as a model, but a point of inspiration. And apparently, we have learned a lot uh, with our interactions with the uh, countries in the region. And when it comes to my question, you mentioned uh, level of engagement and importance of the region. Uh, I would like to ask your expectation from the uh, new administration, Trump administration, uh, about engaging uh, with, with, with the region. What are your expectations, or, or what are your recommendations to the to the next administration, to this administration? Sorry. Well, I do think that um, this administration um, should uh, both continue and build on and scale up on the engagement with the region. Um, I know that from uh, what I hear from the career. Um, um, officials in, in the administration, that that is very much uh, what they are uh, proposing and, and hoping will, will transpire. And I do think that it makes a great deal of sense for, um, for the Trump administration, uh, particularly with the number of, uh, of, of leaders in the administration who actually have some personal level of knowledge and engagement with the region certainly not the least of which is Secretary Tillerson uh, from his prior life. So I think that they will understand and grasp the opportunity there. Whether they have the um, organizational bandwidth to grasp that early on or whether it takes them some time as they continue to grapple with other um, um, areas of focus is, is I think an open question and, and I'd be foolish to, to just, uh, you know, um, wave away that particular challenge. But I think, you know, as I talk to um, former colleagues and, and, and talk to folks uh, um, um, at lower levels of the political um, appointment uh, in the current administration, I think that they do have an understanding of, of the importance here. So I'd like to see it continue and grow. Okay. Um, woman in the back and then one over here, and then that'll finish it off. Um, thank you. This is Mitra from Bush School of Governance. I'm doing an internship with FHI 360 here in DC. Um, so we know that um, South Asian countries, mainly Pakistan and India, is a big market for Central Asian countries, Uzbekistan, and Kazakhstan, and Turkmenistan. Uh, but we know the relationship between Pakistan and, and U.S. is not as strong as before, but they are um, developing a better and a stronger relationship with China. So what does that mean for rule of U.S. and Central Asia? Or what does that mean, what a stronger relationship between Pakistan and China means for U.S. or mainly for stability in Central Asia? Thank you. I think this is an excellent question because uh, about a month plus ago, uh, the 8th and 9th of June, uh, a major event took place in Astana that very few people in Washington noticed and even fewer commented publicly about it. And that is that the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit that took place in Astana simultaneously with opening the expo, um, well, that's where the ceremony of the accession of India and Pakistan to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization mm -hmm. took place. Think about it. Russia, China, India, and Pakistan, four nuclear powers are in the organization that the United States doesn't have even an observer status. What does that mean? What does it mean that Iran and Turkey are considering member, Iran is knocking on the door. Uh, Turkey is considering membership in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Right. Uh, you can say it's not Shanghai because the Secretariat is in Beijing. It's not cooperation, it's more sort of deconflicting or competition management. 
Okay, but nevertheless, it is the organization that includes the nuclear powers and the largest countries in Eastern Hemisphere. And what are we doing with that? We're doing pretty much what we did with Asian Infrastructure Development, Development Bank. Nothing. Uh, I have very serious concerns about that. Uh, I'll be more than happy to lay, to lay this uh, baby at the, uh, uh, the uh, entrance, uh, the door of the previous administration. But I don't think this administration is doing anything different, uh, which is not much. And what uh, Nisha so, sort of gently, kindly said about the professional uh, level of the State Department being willing and able to develop and push policy. The problem is not the professional level right now. And um, you need to keep in mind that that part of the world, for those who see it as Russia's quote unquote, that's, that's not what we need to do 25 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union. As I said in my opening remarks, making sure that no single hegemon comes to dominate that part of the world is probably should be a priority of our foreign policy. Okay, last question's right over here. Uh, Bob Icord from the Atlantic Council Global and Gender Center. Hi, Nisha, how are you? Um, the, um, on this conflict uh, cooperation dynamic, I think one of the important things is the uh, energy water nexus. Nobody's mentioned water. And I remember back, uh, even under the uh, um, Clinton administration, DOD was very concerned about the potential for conflict over uh, water issues. And um, so I, I, I think, obviously, as, as I look at the future of the energy in the region, I think I agree with a lot of you that they have the potential on hydro renewables and natural gas to have a very clean and efficient system if the, if the infrastructure can be developed to, 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 to in cooperation. <coughs> Energy water has been focus of the Shanghai and other regional groups for some time now. But as you look at the future, do you see this issue as one where there is the potential for conflict still existing and managing the Sri you know, Sri Daya and Amadaya rivers and the importance for South Asia? Well, I mean, obviously the, the potential is there, but what I will say, and I think Ariel did reference a, a little bit of, of the, you know, um, water and energy um, 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 dynamic in his opening comments, but what I will say is I think <coughs> that there is an opening um, um, from the Uzbeks to see what there, what mechanisms are possible to create some kind of governance structure that will help to um, um, negotiate and calibrate and balance the competing needs within the region. And I don't want to overstate the opening, but I think that there is an opening there and an understanding of in some way, the inevitability of uh, the need to, to, to come into some sort of a arrangement, right? Um, and we've had many conversations where we've talked about things like um, the Lower Mekong Initiative or, you know, bringing lessons learned from the Mississippi River Commission, um, the you know the the Indus Water Treaty, though I know that has experienced some tensions of its own um, of late, but that there are ways and there are compelling reasons to be able to come um, into some sort of a uh, um, a dialogue around these issues. And I said, like I said, I think that there is an opening today. Um, that did not exist, you know, two or three years ago to try to pursue that. On that, I'd like to thank our guests, and I thank everyone for coming. Today.